Thank you for that. How are we doing? It is so great to be here. I just got in from Cleveland, and I have to go back to Cleveland, unfortunately, um, to witness uh, their democracy over there. So it is nice to be here. I feel like this is, this is some of the ice cream that I get for having to go over there for broccoli. Um, and this speech, I promise, the speech I'm about to read is my speech. Um, I feel that that, I feel that that is very important in front of a room full of teachers. I learned so much from teachers in cut and paste. Um, I learned so much from teachers, the power of teachers. I would not be here without teachers, so I will read my speech. But in this present moment, in which we feel so much crisis, we must remember that our challenge as change makers, first and foremost, is to solve the crisis of imagination we see in people around us. And teachers know how to do that best, because that is what teaching is, making people more able to imagine what's possible for themselves, for others, for the earth, for every field of work, for society, and for all of us. Yet there's another sense of the word imagine, as in, it's hard to imagine how we even got here. Today, Donald Trump is the Republican nominee, and the Tea Party controls the Congress. We have to say that black lives matter because when so many people think about human life and the lives that matter, they don't think about us. We weren't part of the all when it was written that all men are created equal. And we are not included, yeah, and we are not included in the all today when we hear that all children are succeeding or all people being safe or all people having rights or all of us built this country. We are not included so often in that all. Today, education policies sometimes have as much to do with discipline as they do with learning. We have police in our schools oftentimes looking for an excuse to take kids out and land them in prison instead of looking for ways to support communities and keep kids learning. We have zero tolerance policies that apply to kids who make mistakes and make some bad decisions as they're trying to figure themselves out or cope with so many uncopable conditions in their lives. But make no mistake, zero, zero tolerance doesn't apply to bankers who destroy our economy, employers who break commitments to employees, and politicians who advance long disproven ideas we seem to have endless tolerance for those folks. So why does Rudy Giuliani still have a voice? And why does Rahm Emanuel still have a job? But I'd like to put forward another idea. It's actually not that hard to imagine how we got here. Whenever we fail to work together at the deepest levels, this is what we get. When race is at the center of what's happening in education or policing or the economy, but it's the last thing we talk about or it's the last alliance we build, this is what we will get. When corporate power is at the center of decision making, locally and nationally, which affects every single freedom and opportunity in our lives and affects every parent in our community's ability to provide for their child. Yet we don't talk about it. We don't organize around it. Then this is what we will get. The work of imagining is not just the work of seeing what is possible. It is just as important to be imaginative and innovative about the how. How we win. At Color of Change, that is what we do. We figure out how to win. We have a model for impact strategy. Respond, build, 
pivot, and scale. I don't have time to go into all of it, but in the aftermath of voter ID laws popping up around the country and in the aftermath of America seeing what was happening in Sanford, Florida with Trayvon Martin, we responded and we called on our members to get involved and call on the Justice Department to engage. We responded and then we built more and more energy, hundreds of thousands of members calling on the Justice Department, talking about systemic racism, but we also pivoted. We saw the systemic work of the American Legislative Exchange Council in states all around the country. We saw that they were getting money from corporations, corporations who every single day come to black folks and say, buy our products and use our services. They were supporting anti-teacher and student policies. They were supporting voter ID laws. They were supporting stand your ground. They were doing things to weaken our governments and weaken our ability to organize. And we told them that you can't come for black folks' money by day and try to take away our vote by night. And just like so many corporations, they said, you know, we give a little to the left and we give a little to the right. And we said, that's great. But there's not two sides to black people voting. And so we organized and mobilized and we forced over 100 corporations to exit ALEC respond, build, pivot, and scale, working with a coalition of everyday people to make that possible. What we've also realized is that why black people are present all throughout our culture and present in more industries than ever, it does not mean for a minute that we have enough power to do what we need to do to protect ourselves, to make decision makers think twice before blaming their problems on us, or as if we're the cause and not the victim, as if black people are the problem instead of the solution. I believe that black folks, people of color, are the solution. It is the story of black folks in this country that can lead to getting millions of corporate dollars to be pulled out of the RNC convention based off of the Color of Change campaign. They are nearly $8 million short because of our work in begging, for, begging big donors for money or protecting net neutrality, the ability of all information on the internet to travel at the same speed so all of us have a powerful voice to be heard and counted and visible. It is the story of black folks that can expose a right-wing organization like ALEC and its policy shop and force it to come from under the radar and expose their immoral work. And it all comes from constantly finding new ways to organize, to act, to bring more people in and to find the right strategy for the moment and the right thing to do. It will require all of us in this room to work together to build a new way of engaging in our democracy. So to everyone here, I challenge us all to imagine race as a way to win, not something to avoid. And to imagine the power of our unity, civil rights organizations and unions, as both possible and necessary to achieve. Thank you. And now, it's my pleasure because last month, Americans showed that love is stronger than hate. Millions took part in celebrations of LGBTQ pride, and our Muslim brothers and sisters celebrated the holy month of Ramadan. But during that month, our nation was gripped once again by the evils of hatred and bigotry. The Pulse nightclub massacre killed 49 people and injured dozens just because of who they were. LGBTQ. Lately, we've heard ugly, bigoted, racist, xenophobic talk about bathroom bills, building walls, barring people of the entire faith from entering the country. But we can beat this if we come together and break down barriers that have stood in our way for too long. Patricia Crispiano is, heading, is helping to lead that effort. She started her career in 1986 as a teacher of printing in New York City, my hometown. And since that day, she has been an advocate for students, fellow educators, LGBTQ families, and working people. As an openly gay woman and national board member of Pride at Work, an AFL affiliate, 
Pat works tirelessly to bring the gap between, bridge the gap between working families and the LGBT community. Brothers and sisters, my friends, my teachers, please welcome Pat to the stage. Thank you all very much for having me and have a wonderful conference. <laughs>